you don't have to go find success. Success will come find you. It will land right on top of you. I guess in acting, they call it uh, one of the metaphors. I think it's like trying to catch a feather. Hmm. It's like you, if you go chase it, it'll it'll go away yeah. from you. Yeah. But if you just sit there still and let it come, it'll come to you. What do you think about the past when you said you think that statue should come down? Yeah. And the reason I asked this, uh, when I did Finding Your Roots, yeah. which will come out soon, I, I don't care if it's on. Um, he showed me a picture. Obviously, I'm, I'm part black. Yeah. And if you're an American who's been here for a while, if you're black, you obviously, probably more likely, you had slaves. You've got slaves in your family. So I had slaves in my family. And he showed me a picture of the slave owner yeah. of one of, of my, my grandfather who tried to escape and yada, yada. And the guy put out an ad saying, hey, I lost my slave. Yeah. Have you seen him? And that yeah. was my grandfather who escaped. For a while. Uh, From Georgia? or uh, This was in Georgia. Yeah. Yep. Or what, uh, no, North Carolina. I okay. North Carolina or Georgia. And so anyways, he goes, how does it feel to look at that picture? Yeah. And I was talking to my wife about this last night because in the moment I said, I looked at it and I said, okay, yeah, I'm pissed off. Screw this guy. Yeah, sure. But also at the same time, I'm thinking this guy's just in, he's just ignorant. Like, it was just what everybody was doing back then. It doesn't make an excuse, but everybody, this is America, people. And for me to get, I'm not going to give him the satisfaction getting mad at him. Sure. But I don't know. I, I just feel like the if everybody was doing it, it doesn't make it right. But this fool didn't know any better. And he was probably taught that from his family. I'm sure his dad and and he would be lost if he didn't have slaves. Like, so maybe if, even, even if he did want to do something differently back then, it would be financial suicide to not have slaves. Uh, and so, I don't know, I, I look at these- No, it's complicated, the, right? These so questions. I think you can think about it, I, I think you wanna think about it, uh, there's a great quote from, um, uh, from, from Keats, and he says that sort of, he kind of talks about negative capability, the ability to have contradictory thoughts in your head at the same time. Right. Like I think simple minded people can only think of one thing. Yeah. But wisdom is the ability to sort of manage complexity in your mind. So first off, I think it is important to think back and go, OK, like what would it be like to be uh, born in a society where everyone owns slaves? Not just where everyone owns slaves, but the entire culture was predicated not just on slavery not being bad but slavery being a positive good, that it was supported by the Bible, that black people were inferior, that it was actually kind to do, you know, all, all the, go, you go through all of it. So of course it would fuck with your mind. You mm -hmm. would, you, and we should be uh, humble enough to go, if we were born in that society, it would have warped our mind. And it's, uh, it's, it's not for certain that we would have bucked all of that to do the right thing. Yeah. So there's some sympathy at the same time. Uh, and, and there's another question I like. It's like, what would you do if you were born then? Um, instead of thinking about it historically, you should just think about, well, what are you doing now? Right? Mm -hmm. Like, what are the choices you're making now? And, and I think when you think about that way, it, it, it doesn't completely let you off the hook because what about all the people that are massively wrong about stuff in the world right now? But like, it's pretty obvious what the right thing is, right? Yeah. Um, and so you wouldn't give people in the present, you wouldn't let them off the hook, right? You'd be like, you have to avail yourself of the information. You have to make courageous choices. You have to be empathetic. So I think it's complicated. As far as the statues go, and I've written about this a bunch. My view is, look, if it was a statue put up in, let's say, a cemetery uh, shortly after the war in memory of people who died, that would be one thing, right? This statue was put up, for instance, just I know a lot about this one. It was put up in 1910. So it was put up... Uh, 60 years, or no, 50 years after the war. Why was it put up 50 years after the war? And I'll give you my history. So my great-grandfather on my mother's side was drafted by and fought for Germany in the Second World War. My dad's father landed in Normandy, so it was on the right side of it. But like, I have a Nazi in my past, yeah. right? That was 70 years ago. But if today I went to Germany and I was like, I don't think the Nazis were good, but I do want to build a monument to my grandfather yeah. and all the people. You would be like, well, you're obviously just a Nazi sympathizer. Like, why would you do that? Right. Yeah. Why would you put up a statue to a horrible cause to someone that you didn't even meet? 
uh, 50, 60, 70 years after. Yeah. It's because it's a form of propaganda designed to intimidate and celebrate heinous ideas. Uh -huh. So when you actually study why these statues are up, it's not in memorial of flawed people who died. It was put up as part of the Jim Crow segregation, not, not even cause, but part of a corrupt governmental system designed to perpetuate that. So you think about, there were black people here when they put up that statue, right? Like who lived in this town of Bastrop, yeah. but they had been illegally and unconstitutionally stripped of their right to vote, right? They had no say over uh, the laws in this town. They were persecuted and intimidated by the police, by the Klan, et cetera, right? So like that statue is not this law, you know, dated piece of history. It was literally a representation of what you would call white supremacy designed to perpetuate said white supremacy. So I'm not saying you have to, you know, you have to obliterate it into dust. Mm -hmm. I'm just saying you can't, people, uh, have you heard of the Rodney Reed case? No. The Rodney Reed case is like one of the big death penalty cases in Texas that like a lot of people think he's innocent. It's complicated. He's been on death row for a long time. Anyways, the point is a black dude in this town, uh, was sent to death row in the courthouse that he had to walk past said statue to be tried. So my my thinking on it, and we're getting way afield, but is what is the actual purpose of the statue? What is the message it's sending? And then why would we spend tax dollars today to support it and protect it, if that makes sense? I agree. I agree. Yeah. I agree. I, the, the question, and I've read a little bit about this. I forgot the name of the book, but it was really really good um people that are for these statues for family members yeah and they're saying well you know it's not obviously i don't believe what they fought for but it's my great yeah, great my grandpa hair. and i want his statue up just to remember yeah. him you know yada 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 what do you what do you say to those people? Back in the ancient world, philosophy wasn't abstract. It wasn't theoretical. It was designed to help you live the best life. In Stoicism 101, we have a two week course that will introduce you into philosophy that will make you a better person. There's interviews with me, daily lessons that will challenge you to be better, give you new ways of thinking, tackling the problems of life, becoming your best self. As Marcus Aurelius says, you could be good today, but instead you choose tomorrow. Epictetus says, how much longer are you going to wait to demand the best for yourself? Check out our new course, Stoicism 101 at dailystoic.com slash 101. I'm saying I, I would imagine there's actually a great book called How the Word is Passed. Yeah, I, that's the book I yes. read. Yeah, I read that book. Incredible. Yeah, that's the one. Um, how the Word is Passed. Uh, I think, I think, again, if I went, if I was like, there needs to be a Nazi memorial to people like my grandfather in Germany you'd be like, what the fuck are you talking about? Yeah. Like, right? So it's it's only because we have 150 plus years of what they call the lost cause mythology that has laundered and lied and tried to, to uh, cover up the true heinousness of, like the Civil War, I went and I spoke at this Monuments Commission about the thing and I was like, this is literally a monument to the worst cause that has anyone has ever fought a war over. Like, this is the worst cause that anyone has ever fought a war over. We were like, they were like, hey, right now, the constitution doesn't specifically protect slavery. So we're gonna leave the United States and start our own country explicitly founded on our right, not just to own other people and exploit their labor, but also rape them with impunity and kill them with impunity. That's like the worst cause of all time. So the idea that you're like, oh, I just, I just really care about my, the memory of my yeah. relative that you've never met, right, strikes me as actually you're, you've just, inter I, I think people don't like to have the version of the history they were taught as kids challenged. This is what I think the debate over critical race theory is largely about. It's just like, I don't want to have to change my mind, yep. right? And... I think the mark of a smart person is the ability to change your mind. And so I think there's just a lot of just like, I like things how they are. Yeah. And here you are making me uncomfortable by demanding that I update those assumptions. Yeah. Right. And that's hard. I just learned about the trail of tears. Oh, yeah. And I guess 
uh, the cotton rich soil that the United States gave the American native tribes, uh, one of them being the Seminole Native Americans, uh, and then they took it back because they said, yeah. hey, got, that's yeah. great cotton. And we did the same thing with oil once they discovered oil. Once they discovered it, they're like, okay, yeah. give it back yeah. to us. Yeah. You're out of here. Yeah. And forcefully, we'll kill you if you don't yeah. get off. Um, but the, the but before they did that on that soil, uh, the Seminole Native Americans had slaves <laughs> and they had obviously black slaves. And so I think when you, if you're a student, now and I usually, and it's always the young, the young ones that are saying, "Man, I, this is ridiculous! Tear down those statues! Tear yeah. down those statues!" Are you going to change the name of the Florida State football team now, the Seminoles, or is that what they're called? Yeah. Um, do you do you start doing all the these? Uh, and that's part of okay. I don't want to have this conversation now. Let's just move we on. Like, and look, be I've happy been now. rooting for the Redskins for forty years, yeah. and now you're going to call them something else. Yeah, and don't change like, the name. Yeah. Okay, but is that really that? Like, I think uh, people get really caught up in things that don't matter that you would adjust to really quickly. I think I think at the at the core of it, people just don't like change. This is one of the things that Stokes talk about that light everything good has also come from a change, yeah. right? And so people just don't like change, uh, and they definitely don't like they don't like change that would imply that the way they were doing it before was wrong. So yeah. like, I'll give you an example. Like my, I, my parents do this where it'll be like, um, they're like, Hey, you can't uh, like, that's not a thing that we do with kids anymore. I'm not even talking about violence. It's like, Hey, like you can't give a kid X or like, you can't say something like that, like X to a kid. Or like, I remember my mom was like, Oh, you can't put a kid a kid in the front seat of a car, you know, or whatever. Yeah. And and it's like, yeah, you haven't been able to do that since I was a kid. What are you talking about, right? Yeah. Um, and and the the reason they're sensitive to that is because by saying this new way is better and safer, yeah. it's implying that the old way yeah. was not safe or came from some, you know what I mean? And yeah. so so people don't, but but really like you you were doing the best, and I think this goes to your point of the ancestor a little bit, because I mean, he definitely knew when he was holding your great grandmother down and raping her against her will that she probably was not enjoying this, right? Mm -hmm. Or if not in that instance, the vast majority of these encounters are definitely not happening with consent, right? Mm -hmm. So like they knew, but at the same time, they were doing what everyone else was doing. And then this is probably a little bit me too. It's like, oh, but everyone used to make jokes like this. Why am I being sick? People don't like to change if the new change implies that the old way was unfair or mean or unethical or whatever. So, but that is life where we should be getting better and the ways we used to do things should be like, wow, I can't believe we did things that way. Yeah, yeah, and, and, and that's growth. But yeah, God, it's so hard for, like you said, for people to to actually want to change, to to stretch themselves, and people are lazy. Yeah, I mean, of course. I've, I've seen it when I when I played football. Um, guys are lazy, even at the professional level. Sure. Nobody wants to stretch themselves. Nobody wants to put in that extra time because it's uncomfortable, and it, it, mentally and physically. Uh, and spiritually, no, yes. like a, a hardcore religious person, just don't you dare! I can present all the evidence to sure. you that maybe what you're that what you're thinking is not right, and they're like, I don't care. I'm going to continue to do it my way because tradition, uh, and I've always done it this way. And if I do change, like with your parents, if you say, "Hey, you shouldn't have your kid in the front seat," yeah. they're gonna like my mom. Yeah. And I tell her things and she's like, no, well, look at you. You turned out fine. Exactly. Look at you. Yeah. And, uh, and what do you like it, it, the, deep down inside? They're saying, well, you're calling me a bad parent now. Yeah. It's and like, no, I'm not calling me. you a bad parent. You just didn't know. We didn't yeah. have the data then, yeah. right? Like we didn't have the data or we didn't have the technology to do a better alternative. So it's not an indictment of you. It's just, we have better information now. And, uh, Paul Graham has this great essay about how like the more things you identify with, the stupider you are. He doesn't mean like you're a dumb person. He means like when you identify with something, it makes it harder for you to change. So if you identify as like, I identify as a, a, a Southerner who's, you know, comes from a long, proud Confederate tradition. And then I'm like, look, Robert E. Lee was a piece of shit. Uh, you know, look at this, look at this, look at this. 
you can't accept that information because it challenges your sense of you as a human being. And, and this is something I actually wanted to talk to you about. Think about this. If someone identifies as an NFL player or like as a as a all-star or a pro bowler or like a famous person, as you identify with these things that are part of your job that have an expiration date on them, it makes it impossible for you not just to handle the inevitable decline that we all skills would go through, but then what about when you when that does come to an end, mm-hmm. right? Like now you're not that person anymore, but you can't change or adapt because you've identified with it. And then this feels like a form of death when really it's just a transition into something new. Yeah. Yeah. Well, are you asking me like, yeah. how did I deal with sure. that? <laughs> yeah. Uh, I think, I think, you know, as you were talking and we're talking about race it was the first time it's ever dawned on me. Um, and I, cause honestly it wasn't, it wasn't that hard for me. Interesting. And the, and the reason I think it wasn't that hard for me uh, is because may, I'm just thinking out loud yeah. here. So yeah. maybe this is, I haven't thought this fully out, but I'm going to, I'm going to say it the best I can. Like I am multiracial. Yeah. Okay. In part growing up, this is what I thought. I thought I was, I didn't know what the hell I was, honestly. And I still get this question everywhere yeah. I go. The first question people ask me if they don't, if they don't know who I am, like if I'm traveling overseas, uh, well, they do. They say, are you a football player, American football player? Or they say, and then they go, where, where are you from? Who are you? What, what are you? And you look at me and I get it. I look in the mirror every day and I'm going, who do, who, yeah. who do I identify with? And I, so I, I grew up thinking that I knew I was part black. I knew I was part Latino. My la- last name is Gonzalez. My grandfather was from Argentina or so he said he was. Um, and then, and then obviously a little bit of white, uh, and so I grew up with that and that's extremely hard. It really, really is. And any biracial person listening knows what I'm talking about because everywhere you go, you're an outsider, right? You don't, and you were talking about, I'm a Southerner and this yeah. is me. <clears throat> I didn't have that opportunity. I don't, I've never identified with anything. I've, I've never identified with anything because I wasn't allowed to identify with anything. If I would go to a black neighborhood, they would call me white boy. If I would go to a, a um, white neighborhood, they, I've been called nigger. Uh, I'd go, if I was around um, other white neighborhoods, they'd call me beaner, which is a derogatory name sure. for, for, sure. for Mexicans. And I'm, I'm not Mexican or, or wetback, whatever. I've been called that a bunch. I've been called all these racial slurs, not in a fun way either. Like, yeah. like that was a derogatory, like they were calling me out trying to hurt my feelings. And so I've always felt, like I haven't identified and I'm wondering if that's why I'm, I'm never, I never cling to anything. I, sure. I, I'm not a fan of anything. I've never been a fanatic with music, with sports, even growing up as a kid, I didn't, it wasn't like, Oh, the, I, that's my team or that's my guy. Like it was always a, a, a bunch of different, and I'm, I'm, that's why I said I'm kind of putting it all together right now that maybe that's because I've never really identified with anything. I've identified with all of it, but it's never been mine. Well, so it's like you're sort of figuratively a free agent. You just sort of go with what you want to go with or what you feel an affinity towards at a moment, as opposed to like, this is who I am. This is unchanging. And as a result, if someone attacks me for that or undermines that or it changes, like in the case of football going away, you're not feeling some sort of like loss or grievance. No. And I get to be honest. And to me, there's, there's freedom in that. I mean, of course, some people aren't going to like that. Because people want you to pick a side. Yeah. They want you to be on their team. Uh, or they just I, also want things to be simple and obvious, right? The idea that, like, I'm a bunch of things. People are like, I don't have time for this. Like, I want to put you in one box. Yes. So to make it simple for me, it's yes. comfortable for me to put you in a box. I remember Tiger Woods came out and said he's Blasian or whatever it yeah. was. And, and, like, the black community went nuts. Yeah. Uh, maybe the Asian community went nuts. Like, yeah. people went nuts. They're like, no, you are black. Yeah. That's all there is to it. Uh, and... And I, yes, he is black, but why can't you be sure. a little bit? You can identify with everything. I don't know, especially in America. Come yeah. on, we're in America. Um, I remember when I wrote, I wrote this book about Peter Thiel and the sort of inciting incident for him in conspiracy was that this website outed him as gay. And he was like upset about that. And so people said, well, is it because you're ashamed of being gay? Like, obviously, if he, they're like, we're not saying it's bad. Why are you upset that we said that you're gay? 
And I think they were being a little disingenuous because the, the tone of the article that outed him was like very sort of sneering and, and sort of condescending. But his point was like, that's just not the thing I want to be known for. He's like, I want to be known as like an investor or an entrepreneur. Yeah. I don't want to be a gay entrepreneur. In the same way that like women, uh, they're like, don't call me a, an actress or a waitress. Like I'm not the female version of that thing. I just am the thing. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. You know what? I don't, I don't give a shit. What do you think of me? Honestly, for the most part, yeah, sure. you, know, you can put me in whatever box you want. Yeah. I'm going to be okay. Yeah. And because I have, I have my inner circle. I have my wife, I have my children, and I have my, you know, my, my couple close, really good friends. And I care about what they think. Yeah. For most people out there, I want to be the best I can for you. I'm trying for that. It's sure. important to me, but I'm not connected to that. I don't, I don't need it, but I want it. I want you to approve of me, but I don't need you to approve of me. And I'm working my ass off to perform for you on the football field sure. or like you talk about the transition to, to broadcasting or acting, which is what I'm doing now. Like I'm trying my, and I'm going to work my ass off to do the best I can to present the best product or best performance I can. And I want you to like it, but if you don't, then I just nothing I can do it because it's out of my control. I guess that's stoicism. That's, that's right the that. definition of control. stoicism. <laughs> yeah. That is, is this thing up to me? Mm -hmm. And yeah, one of my favorite quotes from Marcus to realize he's basically saying like, look, like, um, Ambition is like tying what you say and think and do to like what other people say and think, right? Like I want to be uh, selected to the Pro Bowl or I want to be given a scholarship or I want to be con you know, inducted to the Hall of Fame or I want to be, I want the Critics Choice Award or bestseller list, right? Th those things. But he says sanity is tying it to your own actions. Yeah. So like you have to, in a way you have to come, it's not that the external scorecard is not important because of course it is. If you don't catch the ball, if you don't get enough yards, like you, you don't get paid or you don't get the same size contract that you might. Like if my books don't sell, people stop asking me to write books or they stop paying me to do books. Um, but if that's your success, well, what if you do something that's like ahead of its time? Or what if you do something that uh, people don't appreciate or don't expect? Or, you know, what, what if you're doing it for a different set of motivations? Then you're not going to get that thing that you're now you've you've essentially said success is up to my success is somebody else's decision, mm -hmm. which is not a good place to live and not a good place to do good work from. I think you have to cultivate like your own metric of success. So I try to be in a place where like the book is a success on day one, like before it comes out or so day zero, let's say, or day negative one. And then everything else is extra. Like I know the process was enjoyable. I know it was creatively fulfilling. I know objectively I did something that I wanted to do. And then if it sells a thousand copies or a million copies, which isn't fully in my control, that is only extra or no more than I already have. Do you still have your, do your feelings get hurt? Sure. I mean, so Conspiracy, I think is my best book. It's probably sold the least well of all the books. It's still a success. Like by, if any other author published it and it sold that many copies, they'd be like, that's so nice. You did a, you did a good job. Mm -hmm. But like, uh, and you could make a living, but it, it didn't do what I wanted it to do. Like it didn't, it didn't, it didn't, it, its success is not, let's say its sales figures are not commensurate with like my judgment of it. Uh -huh. But like, in a sense, I was glad that that happened because it helped decouple the two from each other. Yeah. So now I know I can do my best work and it might not be my most commercially successful work. Conversely, uh, I did this book, Growth Hacking, uh, several years ago that my publisher suggested. And I was into it and I liked, I'm glad I did it, but it sold like very well and been lucrative. But like, it, like when I'm looking back on my life, I'm not like, oh, I'm that, that was so meaningful to me. So yeah. it helped decouple commercial success and creative fulfillment slash like challenge of it. And so now I, I try not to think about that. Uh-huh. That's, <laughs> I also, uh, you, 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 it sounds like a like an artist who a, a musician playing yeah. playing the hits playing the music like yeah. okay this song that we were kind of into all of a sudden is like the most yeah. popular song in the in the world uh, but the stuff I really really want to make is not really 
you know, received well. Uh, and so what, what do you do then? Like that's, that's the, the well, I think part. ideally there should be a track for both. Like, I mean, there should be a track for both, like some mm. you know, sort of, what do they call it? Like one for me, one for them. You uh-huh. know what I mean? You, just, you kind of think about it that way. I mean, ideally you want both. Ideally you want it to be very creatively fulfilling and commercially successful. Like why would you make something that you didn't want to be reached to people, a, a lot of people. But, um, I think you have to, you have to ultimately ask yourself, like, who is in charge? Like this audience, this mob that I'll never meet, also random luck, or like am I in, I in charge? Yeah, yeah. Let me ask you something, because I'm, I'm about to start like the next book in this series that I'm doing, and I wondered if you might have some insight or, or relate to it. Like when you, so, so the season ends, and then you're, you get a couple months off or whatever, and then you're starting to gear up for the next season. What was your feeling about that? Were you excited for a new season to start? Or was there sort of a dread for you that you knew it was going to be very hard and it would be grueling? <laughs> Once again, like you said, I forgot who you, who you said said that, but you can have both feelings yeah. at the same yeah. time. It's kind of like bittersweet. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's, you know what's coming. You know what you just went through, the strain it put on your body, mentally, yeah. physically, spiritually, your family. It's very, very stressful. Football, people always ask me, they're like, man, do you miss it? And I'm like, hell no. Right. But then part of me goes, hell yeah. Yeah. I, I, both. I mean, it's like graduating from high school. I, I, yeah, you're going to miss it, but you, I don't miss getting my ass kicked. Right. The fight, the monotony of going every single day, it becomes so boring because it's a grind, right? It's a, gr- it's, a, it's, a, it's a tremendous grind. And football, people, I played basketball too. And I had an opportunity to maybe go pro basketball. Uh, certainly my career wouldn't have been, it wouldn't have been as good as, as I was, just from a physical standpoint. Um, and, but to me, it's the best decision ever made, obviously, to go play football. Because football, but, but football is a fight. Yeah. Basketball is better than football from a physicality standpoint. Football, especially back when I played, it's a it's a constant fist fight yeah. every single day. Imagine going to the it's like boxing, I guess. Yeah. Like it's not, it's not fun. Yeah. It's not fun. The games are are fun, but it's not fun. Uh, and so, you, you and when you're going into your off season, you remember all the good. You, obviously, you try to focus on the good. That is, that's the way I did it. I remember the good times, the positive stuff that I did. Uh, and then you take some time off where I didn't do anything for that first month. Uh, and then slowly but surely, I'd start getting back into it. I wouldn't even touch a football. Really? Uh, that was the beauty of basketball for me. Basketball was my saving grace because I would just go play basketball because I right. really, really enjoyed it. So you it. could stay in shape. Stay in shape. And I played every single day and I played competitively. I played, shoot, I even tried out for the Miami Heat one off season. Uh, but I play in the summer pro leagues out there with Magic Johnson, uh, a lot of uh, Bo Outlaw, I remember Antoine Jameson, like uh, Anton Walker, Paul Pierce, like all these these pro leagues, I, I was in them. Yeah, I'm doing well. For, yeah, <laughs> but, uh, but that would be a way for me to take my mind off of football. And sure. then once the summer came, I started gearing up into it, and you started slowly but surely getting my mind wrapped around what I want to do, uh, set some new goals, uh, keep building off of of what I did before. Uh, you're never satisfied. I think right. that's that's how you become truly, truly great. I, I never rested and said, oh my God, I'm, I'm, I was first team all pro last year. It's like, nah, I got to get even better. I had a thousand yards. I need, I need 1200 yards this year. I need to keep pushing myself. That's, that's pretty much how it went for me every single year. Yeah. There's an expression uh, painters like painting writers, like having written. And mm. so it's like, I imagine uh, having played football is probably more fun in some ways than the, than the actual <laughs> game of playing football. Cause like, I mean, you're getting hit by people running at, full speed and uh-huh. people who are trying to hurt like like so it's this balance of like obviously you love doing it or you wouldn't compulsively do it but at the same time it takes a toll on you yeah it does take a toll uh like i said physically mentally spiritually and you go through the ups and downs i've 17 years man i've had my share of depression i've had my share of of, of bad moments uh, maybe I didn't handle it like how I wanted it, wanted to, uh, the drinking, the partying, you know, you, you, fame, all that, all that stuff goes, goes into the, to your career and it should, I mean, that's life. That, that's how, that's how it's shaped. Uh, but f- for me, what I struggled with most and into that transition to was, and, and even still to this day, like I, I have a little bit of that imposter syndrome. Oh yeah. Like I, I don't ever really 
it takes me a while to feel totally, totally confident. And that's what took me so long to become really good in the NFL. I didn't get any faster or stronger between my rookie year and my third year when I was first team all pro. Those first two years were shitty for me. And it was, and the only reason it was because I wasn't confident. And I, that's what's kind of plagued me throughout my, I don't even know if it's a plague. Maybe it's a good thing. I'm, I'm starting to read that imposter syndrome is actually a good thing. Yeah. And, and maybe it is, but I, I, I can't shake it sometimes. I just don't feel so confident when I'm, when I'm doing certain things. I mean, there's a story about Marcus Aurelius that he's sort of chosen to be king. And he like, he supposedly, this is, he's a young man, but he sort of breaks down in tears because he's like, literally all kings have been bad. There's like no examples of like good ones. They're all, they all break bad. They end up being terrible tyrants, like addicted to pleasure, et cetera. And he's sort of wondering whether he can do it. And then he has his dream later that he has shoulders made of ivory, that he is sort of strong enough to do it. But I was wondering that about your career because yeah, you have a, uh, a sort of a slow start. Um, but I wonder, do you think you could have played as long as you played if you'd come out of the gate stronger? I don't, obviously I don't, I don't know, but uh, I've, it's the best thing that ever happened to me. You're right. If I would have came out and played, I would have never went through that dark, dark time in my career uh, where I, I doubted myself so much. I'm talking, yeah. it, I got benched. I got written up in the papers telling me I was a bust. Like that stuff hurts. And, and I still hold on to that. I mean, that's a chip I'll have for the rest of my life of being so embarrassed uh, and feeling so much shame and guilt and all that stuff. I mean, it was all of it rolled up into one. Uh, but I think when you go through those situations um, and I'm, you know, I, I read a lot and I read a lot of biographies and it seems like a lot of the people that have achieved greatness go through those really extremely dark times. Like there's nothing wrong with, with going through those extremely dark times uh, as long as you eventually figure it out. Yeah, Churchill says that every prophet has to go through the wilderness mm -hmm. and then uh, from the wilderness, uh, this is where they, they produce psychic dynamite. The idea being that you have to go through this experience where you're sort of sent away. It's kind of the hero's journey where you're sent away, you're doubted, you struggle. Um, and then if you come out of the other side of that, you're much stronger. Um, I remember I was talking to uh, John Snyder once, the GM of the Seahawks, and he was saying like, um, they have trouble when they draft players who have never been through anything before. Because like almost everyone goes through some version of that dip when you start, because you're like the best in college. Yeah. And then you're like, oh shit, like the, N the NFL is another level. Yeah. The NFL is another level. And if you've never had to adjust to like not getting everything you want and like struggling and having to learn and grow, like it's going to kick your ass. Yeah. Yeah. It will. I had that when I was younger, I guess kind of, I had a bully. Oh, people can look up that story, but, but I had a bully. Long story short, I had a bully. I played Pop Warner football. I was the worst kid on the team. Had this bully come down, try and beat me up. Uh, and that changed everything and it helped me become a better football player. Yeah. Uh, but then after that, once I figured that out, football, oh man, I just, I was the man yeah. until I was a first round draft choice. I was that guy that your guy probably wouldn't like. But I bet in that experience, as you were adjusting, even though you still struggled, you were drawing on the strength that you drew on. Like if you hadn't gone through what you went through as a kid, maybe you wouldn't have made it out of the other side of those three years. And, and you're right. And maybe I wouldn't have, but I still did not know the formula for success when I became a professional. Sure. Now, before that, Talent wise, I'm six, five. I can jump really high. I'm strong. I'm quick. I'm athletic. This is just, and I didn't ask for this. This was just given to me from birth genetically. Uh, and so I relied on that a lot. Now I worked hard. Don't sure. get me wrong. I worked my ass off, but I did my working my ass off was what they told me to do. Yeah. So if practice started at one, I showed up at one and I worked my ass off for those two hours until three o'clock, three 30, whatever it is, and went home. Right. I did exactly what they asked me to do. And this is what I tell, uh, incoming rookies now in the NFL. Uh, I say, welcome to the world of you're no longer special. Yeah. No one gives a shit. Yeah. You ran a four, three. So does he, so does he, so does he. Sure. Oh, you benched 400 pounds. So does he. So, oh, your first team all American. Good. Good. Good for you. You won the Heisman. So that guy over there, he won the Heisman. He doesn't even start. Yeah. Okay. Nobody cares yeah. who you are and what you've been through anymore. What's going to separate you at the professional level. This is, I don't care what it is. It's the, it's the obsession. Yeah. It's the, 
for me, I had to figure it out. I had to go out. I can't show up from, at one o'clock yeah. and be done at 3.30 after practice. I have to show up earlier, 30 minutes before everybody gets out there, and I need to catch balls. Yeah. And while the defense is going, I need to catch balls. While When coach calls us up afterwards and everybody goes home to go play video games and go talk to the sweetie pies, I'm going to stay after and I'm going to catch more balls. Yeah. With my chin strap buckled, mouthpiece in, eyes wide open, focused, in the game situation, getting ready, obsessed with being the best. When I go home, I don't turn it off. I can be watching a basketball game or a football game. And I'm always thinking about, okay, how am I going to get better? Yeah. I, I, I make the joke, like I'd, I'd be walking down a hallway in my house. And I still do this to this day. I'll, I'll fake left and go right <laughs> around the corner sure, sure, to, sure, go, sure. to go get something out of the refrigerator yeah. because it's just, I was so obsessed and so programmed with that. Uh, and that's one of the things, you talk about that transition. I forgot that's, that that's what made me so great at football. And I think a lot of players forget about what made them so great when they played. And that's why you look at the statistics when players get done playing any professional sport, uh, they, they, it's a huge fall off. I mean, depression, uh, financial troubles, divorce, uh, addiction, all that stuff that happens. And I think it's because they expect to be great again right away at whatever it is they choose. Not you're realizing, starting at zero. Right, not realizing the thing. that you got to go through all that embarrassment again, all that boring work again, all that stuff that made you great before you, you forget. And I forgot. I forgot. Yeah. I thought, okay, well, I'll study for an hour and get ready for this broadcast and I'll be great. And it's like, no, it, it well, that's, that's great. ego, right? The idea that like you have like the Midas touch, right? Yeah. That like, because you, you were good here, that, like think about it, an investor, you make some great investment, you pick some company, it sells for a lot. Now, just like the next thing that you're like, oh, that could be good. You know, that yeah. doesn't, you have, you have to, everything you're, there's a rule in writing that your last book doesn't write your next one. You're always starting at zero. And I think that's why this one is intimidating to me. And I think it's good that it's intimidating to me because like the second you think that you're entitled to it or that it just happens, that's when you fall off. Yeah. Right. I mean, obviously you learn some tricks of the trade and it becomes easier in some respects, but if the second it loses its ability to scare you a little bit, uh, you're probably coasting and somebody's going to get you. I agree. And I, and I like that. But another thing that I learned through that second year going into my third year, where I went from being benched twice to being first team all pro six months later, whatever, yeah. the next season, uh, also putting in that extra work. But then also I got to the point too, that I was so depressed and feeling so bad about myself that I finally said, I don't give a shit anymore. Yeah. Like you're too self-conscious about it. I don't care. It. Yeah. I don't care whether you like what I'm doing or not. My teammates, I didn't care anymore whether you liked me or not. I'm going to do my thing. Yeah. Uh, and I didn't, I'm, I'm out there. It was, I don't know, maybe it's a little bit of selfish too. It's like, I'm going out there and I'm just going to play my game. Yeah. I'm going to do what I want to, what feels natural. I'm going to, I'm going to be totally proud. I'm not thinking about when I run this 12 yard corner uh, in the end zone, I'm not thinking about the touchdown. I'm just totally focused now being as free as I possibly can. It's the same thing in acting. That's why I think I'm drawn to acting and broadcasting, it's live television and acting. Like you can't be thinking about the end and you can't be thinking about what just happened. You have to be totally in the moment and free. free. Yes. And the only way you're gonna be free is if you don't give a shit. No, I think that's totally right. And I think uh, that's how I, I try to remind myself as I'm like intimidated by projects or whatever is like, don't think about, I'm not trying, this, this thing I'm starting, because I'm supposed to start in like two weeks. I'm starting in two weeks. I can't take the end state of the book I am publishing next, like the last book, and compare it to where I am here. I'm starting totally fresh in both, in all senses of the word, right? Yeah. And then I just have to be present and just do what I have to do like right now. So I just think, what's like a small, con like I just think about like, what's the contribution that I have today? What's the deposit that I have to make today? And I know if I do that and I don't quit and I bring to it every day, the level of like commitment and intensity, et cetera, required, eventually I'll get there. Yeah. Could take a year, could take five years, could take 20, you know, you don't know how long it's going to take, but if you're like, I'm not going to quit till I finish this, I'm going to put you'll, you'll get there. Yeah. So that's, that, that's small steps, yes. small steps or 1% growth per, yes. per day. Like, like yes. all the stuff that people talk about that's in all great wisdom. Yes. Uh, religion, people, great people, 
they all say the same thing. That's that's the point. All of it is the same thing. Yes. <laughs> wrapped in different boxes. Yeah, of boxes. course. <laughs> well, I mean, yeah, think about it. Like you're some uh, like Buddhist monk or you're a Stoic philosopher or you're a football coach trying to, you know, teach some young player who's struggling. The situations are the same. I mean, they're still people and they're intimidated by this big thing. And they're like, what if you just focus on this little part of it and you just do it? You know, the process is the process whether it's you're coming at it from a spiritual tradition, a philosophical tradition, a performance like coaching, you know, it's yeah. it's it's not like any of the variables are changing just because it's different names or races or time periods in history. It's like people have been trying to solve tough problems or get to elite performance for thousands of years. And like they're like, you got to be present. Don't get distracted by the end result. Mm -hmm. Like you got to do your best. Like it, they're cliches for a reason. Yeah. Yeah. And a word as I watch you speak. And I think when you watch the greats, when you see the Jordan, the Tom Brady, the great politicians, great actors, you see a certain level of, of calmness too. Yeah, of course. That, that kind of changed everything for me. The way I put the word on it, on yeah. everything we talk yeah. about, your focus, your present. To me, being present is being extremely calm. Yes. Uh, not letting your emotions, it's Bill Belichick right there. That's why I think he's the best coach in all sports. Yeah. Because of his ability to stay calm no matter what. B big win, he'll smile a little bit and get happy, but a big loss, hey, we got our butts kicked. It's almost the same. You look at his press conferences where they, where they win or lose, it's the same. And my, a lot of people probably don't like that. And you look at someone like um, a, an emotional coach. There was a guy named Rex Ryan, who's a hell of a coach, yeah. but very up and down emotional. And then you get a team like that and you get your family like that, whether you're yeah. the head of the household, like it's important with your kids, with your wife, with your family, with your business, with whatever it is, to stay that level. Calmness. Yeah, like an even keel. And that helps, I think that helps creativity. I think that helps you assert your confidence. It helps, everything begins, at least to, for me. Yeah. It begins with that level of calm. Yeah, I mean, my word for that is stillness. stillness. And the, the idea is like, when I think about all the, the best moments in my life, whether it's like performance, whether it's like uh, happiness, like whether it's like beauty, all the, like when I'm like, this was awesome. I wasn't like at an 11. I was at like five. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? It like you'd calm things down. You were doing, you weren't doing like 20 things at the same time. You were present, you were focused, you, you were still. And I think the tension though is like to be great at whatever it is you do, you also have to have an intensity yeah. that you have to really want it and you have to be aggressive and ambitious and like, uh, like invested. So like it's, I, th I think, like when people are like, oh, does that mean you don't care? No, it's that you care. You The default is you care a ton. And then you have to figure out how to ratchet that down because that intensity will make you not as good as you could be. You'll make emotional decisions. You'll take things too seriously. Except like, obviously Bill Belichick loves football and he is intensely driven to win. Yeah. So he has to work that, that calmness has to sit on top of that intensity. I think if, if you had a filter, like everything you talked about, all yeah. the intensity, the putting the hours in the presence, everything. And then at that last stage, before yes. you go out on the, before you go out on the stage yeah. or the field or the arena or the conference room or with your family, the last thing to remember is the calmness, it's stillness. Yeah. Yes. Uh, of all the books I've, I've read, a majority of your books, Stillness is the one that that touched that that oh, amazing. for me the most because I was you know that I think that that was part of my problem those first two years in the league I was I was trying so hard and trying to force it and trying to for, and, let, and when you stay calm you don't and you have a nice routine and you're calm you don't have to go find success success will come find you it will land right on top of you I guess in acting they call it uh, one of the metaphors i think it's like trying to catch a feather hmm. it's like you if you go Dude. chase it it'll it'll go away yeah. from you yeah but if you just sit there still and let it come it'll come to you and you have to trust that takes a lot of trust mm -hmm. uh and that's where the training comes in sure you're only as good as your training yeah uh I, I think that's that's been the biggest get for me and i keep getting it that keeps coming up in my life um that uh, confidence 
still, still, stillness and confidence. Yes. When you can mix those two along with the work and the intensity and all that stuff, that's when great things will happen. Well, and that's why I think ego is so dangerous because I would say ego is not calm and not confident. Yes. Right. Ego is this like, it, people think it looks like confidence and maybe it looks like confidence on the outside, but inside it's like buzzing. It's like fundamentally insecure. It's sensitive to slights. You know, it feels like it has to prove all these things. It has these, this grandiosity, this sense of oversized sense of your own importance. So like, to me, the egotistical person, it seems like they're having a good time, but like, they're the ones actually, it's like, you know, like a duck, it's like sitting on the water. It looks calm, but it's like fucking yeah. furiously paddling. That's what ego is to me. And so you push that ego away and you actually get to a place of calmness and confidence because you're like, I've done the work. And I also know that, that if I don't calm down and get control of myself, I won't be able to access the, or use the training and the skills that I have as effectively. Yeah. Yeah. I have... One, my, my, uh, my 12, I have a 12 year old named River and he is an intense dude, quick to anger, quick to shout and yell. And this is something that I, that I stress with him and to see how he's evolved his game. It's like taken off now. Cause he's yeah. just being more relaxed. I'm like, you have to, you have to buy into that, that stillness. You, you have to, otherwise it, it's, it's, you're in for a chaotic life an, an up and down life. And it's, I don't, I don't like that emotions on my sleeve type Yes. leader. No, it's like emotions. It's not that you, I think people have this understanding of the Stoics as being emotionless. I think it's that they try to do away with destructive emotions. Yeah. Where they try not to make decisions based on their emotions, right? It's like uh, being angry about something is not the same as doing something out of anger mm -hmm. or um, having an insecurity and then projecting that insecurity out in the world, that's yeah. not gonna be helpful, right? Yeah. And so you, you wanna cultivate the ability to detach from your emotions a little bit and then be like, well, what is actually the best thing to do here? It might be to do what your anger is telling you to do, but to do it out of anger is probably not the best way to do it. Yeah, out of, I remember too, my, I, was, it was, I was at Cal, Berkeley, when I was playing football. And one of our defensive players came in and at halftime and this dude was yelling and screaming and going nuts, nuts. He's like, I want it so bad. Like it was like just angry. And he's like, we're going out there. We're going to kick their ass second half. And he went out there and played the worst half of, of his course. life. And it's, it's like blinding. That was one of the first times yeah. I, I like yeah. uh, unknowingly noticed. I'm like, dude, he's calm down. Like you can't. Yeah. You can't, you can't play that way. You can't well, you think, operate that like, way. Think about why do players talk trash, right? It's to make the other player angry. Yeah. And then you know they're not going to be as good, right? Yeah. And then we do that to ourselves all the time, right? Like yeah. we know that anger in other people uh, distracts them, pisses them off, overwhelms them, gets them into trouble. And then, then we're like, but with me, my anger is a good is good fuel and it's like no it's not no, not it's at not. all no it's not just look at the greats yeah just look at them look at tiger look look at look at tom i mean these people you don't have to say their last name that's because yeah. they they are they show that like michael and they're just so calm and yes. so graceful they might be not calm or controlled in other parts other, of their life and it causes life. lots of problems for them yeah. but in the, the thing where it matters the most they're very calm which that's a, that's a whole different subject how do, how do you let off that steam too. Like, yes, um, you got to have outlets for it. What's the? How do you get rid of that dark side? Well, so so I, I was curious about you. Then, so you leave, uh, you 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 leave football. You go into broadcasting, and now you're doing acting. Has has your? I, I've got to imagine there's some athletes that are like, well, I'll be good at this too. But w did you go into those things as being like, no, I'm starting from zero again, and I got to figure out this craft? No, no. I mean, uh, no, because because I didn't know what to expect. Uh, the broadcasting was a little bit easier, just because it's the game of football. So I know yeah. I know football, and I've I've had a microphone in front of my face my whole career, so I knew I could be okay at it. Um, and I put good work into it. I mean, I, I didn't put great work into it, and uh, so that was a little. But it was little. It was a little bit easier. Sure. Uh, and it's not easy for all. I mean, you see a lot of these big names that try it and it, it just doesn't work for them. Uh, acting was, it's a whole different animal. 
I mean, that's that that because that's totally outside of sure. what, what I did. And so I thought that okay, just because I've done a couple sitcom guest guest stars and I've done a couple of you know a couple of these movies, and I had a couple lines here and there that that okay, I'm I'm great. I could be great at this. Yeah. Uh, and then, you know, I got, I got my ass kicked. I got, I got embarrassed. I got really embarrassed. Um, and you have, but, I, but looking back, it's like, I had to go through that. Yeah. And then you start to remember, okay, well, shoot, I can't just study this part for 30 minutes, an hour. This isn't, you know, a football broadcasting, yeah. you know, I, I got to like throw everything I have into it and be willing to go through the fire again, be willing to go through the embarrassment, the boring, all that stuff that comes with being great. Uh, and then I finally figured it out. Um, and I'm not, and I, by the way, when I say figured it out, I figured out the formula. You're on a path. I'm on that path. You'll yeah. never figure it out. Yeah, I mean, sure. you shouldn't, you'll never ever arrive. It's just, you want to keep, 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 get, keep getting better. But also I imagine there's an Epictetus quote I like. He says like, if you want to improve or get good at something, you have to be willing to be seen as foolish or ignorant. Yeah. And so I imagine acting is hard one, because, you know, like, it's a stereotype, but like the jock doesn't also do theater, right? Yeah. So like, I imagine uh, there's the challenge of just the emotional vulnerability and the, the, the sort of the different parts of you that acting is, is accessing, but then, and, and so you have, to, you have to have a certain amount of sort of courage and self-control to do that and, and be willing to be seen as something different or, or act in a way that maybe people don't expect from you, but then also the willingness to go from world class at one thing to not world class at the other thing and not be like, fuck this, I quit. Yeah. That must be the hardest part. It's the hardest part because the, the chances are that that you're gonna make it in acting or any like yeah. really great professional th thing that you, job that you wanna do, I mean, it's slim. And, and, and we all know that though too. Right. And that's why I think we quit sometimes. It's like, man, I put everything I had into it and it still didn't work. So I might as well quit and do something else. And I got to the point like that with, with, with acting. Uh, in fact, I almost did. I, I, I gave up. I remember I was trying and trying. I started, um, and I, but I went to all the classes. I started, I was doing two classes a week. I was really throwing myself into it. And I was doing all these auditions and getting nothing, nothing. Right. Getting yeah, even the, to, to go from being everything is inbound. Hey, Tony, we want you to do this. Hey, Tony, we want you to do this. We want this endorsement, you know, blah, blah, blah. To then having to go like being rejected for stuff. Yeah. That would be a challenge. Yeah, and, you get, and that's, that's acting though. Yeah. I mean, you have to understand that. Or just even putting yourself out there. I want this. And they're like, no, you're not right. No. That, no. That's not fun. And that's the thing about acting too. You walk into a room, they, they've already made up their minds sometimes. Right. They're like, no, nah, no. Nah. Uh, and then somewhat being somewhat recognizable where uh people just want to come meet you or something like yeah, that yeah. And they're like hey come in hey yeah i loved you man yeah, yeah. The way. And then, I we've know, already decided but we just wanted to see you <laughs> anyway to see if yeah. we could do it. but you know it's it's been it's been great and now i've been able to get some momentum i got a couple you know did a couple movies got a couple shows now and and, and you start to you just it's all part of it. Yeah. I mean, you, you have to fail, 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 fail. And then you finally will crack one a little bit open. And you're like, okay, I can do this. Uh, and then you start building off of that. Yeah. And you have to remember that, like I told you, confidence was a problem for me. And I used to teach my kids this, and I think I was wrong. I used to tell them after games, because maybe this is what I did. I'd be like, but I didn't do it. But I thought I was doing this. Where I was like, hey, you... Remember, uh, like my son, we'd play a basketball game or my son would play football and he'd have like six or seven tackles in the game. But I'd be like, hey, you missed three tackles. Right. Go home and think about those missed tackles. That's what you need to focus on. And I, to me, I thought that was right. But that's, I did focus on the things that where I got it wrong. But for the most part, I was focusing on where I got it right. That's what I replayed over and over in my head. And I built, I was building off of that. And now I tell my kids like, like, yeah, you had a couple turnovers, River, whatever, in his basketball game. But man, you, those that step back jumper, remember that. Remember you did that and keep building off of that. That's what you think about before you go to sleep tonight. And, and first of all, it makes it more fun for you. Sure. You know, keep your confidence up. It'll keep you coming back for more. Because if you keep this negative way of thinking, uh, and there's books written on it, the power of negative thinking or whatever, like you, that'll, that'll kill you in the long run. That'll yeah. make it not fun. Yes. And, and, and it doesn't build confidence if you it doesn't build confidence, right? Like if, if you're focusing on what you did wrong, in some sense, it does uh, potentially allow you to solve for that thing. Like if all you focus on is what you did right, 
then you know, you're never going to fix your mistakes. But if all you focus on is what you did wrong, you're also not going to develop any confidence. You're not going to develop any like enthusiasm or pleasant memories with the thing. Yeah. And, uh, and yeah, it, it's, a, it's a tension that you, it's, you have to do both. Again, to go to what we're talking about, you have yeah. to be able to see what you did wrong, but also not let that so consume you that you don't see that you did most of what you needed to do right. Absolutely. And I want to ask you a question. What is your thoughts on a balance in life? Work well, that, balance, family balance? Yeah. I mean, I, I think about it in terms of like sustainability. And so like, like did, let's say drugs influence or make like Jimi Hendrix or Kurt Cobain or whomever's music better? Maybe but it also killed them. So it's not good fuel, uh -huh. right? So like I think about um, like, f let's say, uh, like a lot of people think that like having kids, for instance, it makes it hard to continue to write. And this is definitely true for women, especially historically, because like, uh, you know, having kids is, it takes so much time and they didn't have time to write or the freedom to write or make changes or whatever. So um, it definitely takes something out of you in the short term, I think. But if it opens you up emotionally, if it balances you out, if it gives you, we we're talking about an outlet or, you know, some sort of other thing that you're, I think my interest is not to write like a couple good books and then like take the money and retire. I want to get really good at this over a long period of time, right? Like the, one of the benefits of acting or writing versus football is like, like Tom Brady's like the longest ever do it. And it's not really that long, right? Like, uh -huh. he, like it's like, can you believe he's still doing it? And he's in his early 40s, right? <laughs> like, like people publish great books when they're 80. You know what I mean? So like I, I'm thinking about it over a long horizon. And so when I think about family and life and balance and pacing myself, et cetera, I'm thinking about that. Like, is this, I, I'm hoping it's contributing to me being able to do it sustainably and at a high level of excellence over a long period of time. And also, like, when I hear about these people, like, you can't have a family, don't have a kid, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, but how you're, cut, you're, you're cutting yourself off from a huge part of the human experience. And then you're supposedly going to make art or work that relates to those people. You, you, you need that. But I think the balance is actually really important to being able to do it over a long period of time and not lose your mind. Well, that's... That's what scares me with, uh, with my profession, anything that I do now. Uh, and, and I got a good balance right now, yeah. quote unquote. But if the more success you have, uh, and with that obsession comes, okay, how are you going to be the best parent you can, the best husband you can? And I, you look at the, the people that have done extraordinary things, you look at their personal lives. Yeah. Uh, but doesn't it, it don't you whew, think it undermines those accomplishments? <laughs> like when I, like Hemingway, shitty husband, shitty parent. To me, that is a pall that hangs over the works. Do you know what I mean? But doesn't, isn't that a lot of uh, Buddha leaving yes. his family? Yeah. Uh, I look at maybe Martin Luther King. Like uh, you look at the presidents. I look at coaches. There's a lot of coaches sure. that have shitty families. I won't name names, but there's a lot of like famous, famous, famous coaches that their home life is abysmal and their, their relationship with their children is not good. Uh, and be, can you have, can you be obsessed with something and still have that, 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 that I think it, I it, it certainly know, can, it certainly can be done, right? Yeah, there are can. people that do it well. So the question is, like, um, I, who is it? I forget. Um, some author, and he was saying that early on in his career, someone said to him, uh, every kid you have is a book you won't write, right? Uh -huh. um, let's say being a better father, it's, it's, so we don't name names, the better, being a better father or mother would have earned this coach one extra Super Bowl or 10% more wins or made this artist's work 10% better. Who gives a shit? Yeah. Right? Like Marcus Rios talks about this. He's like, people who long for like posthumous fame to be considered the best who ever did it, they're forgetting two things. One, that um, they won't be around to enjoy the posthumous fame, right? Yeah. And two, uh, 
the people in the future will also suck. So why do you really care that much about mm -hmm. impressing them? Right. And so I think sometimes, yeah, you go like, this is what it takes. This is the trade off. Yeah. But like, why are you making that trade off? Like to, you know what I mean? Like you've already, you've already proven that you can master this thing. You've already proven that you can win. You've already made a positive impact in the world through what you've done. I, I guess the, the virtue of temperance or moderation is really important. Like taken too far, the greatness becomes a vice or an addiction. Uh, and you don't even get the benefit of like, like at a certain point you have enough. Yeah. And I think you have to, I think I'm more interested in being great at my thing. And I yeah. think about, I, I have sort of a trinity. So for me, it's like, I want to do great work. I want to have great marriage. And then I want to raise great kids. And those three things, they're not in tension with each other, but they, they check each other in the same way that we have an executive and a legislature and, and, uh, and uh, a judicial branch. They check each other out. And if one of them has too much power, it screws up the balance of those three. So I, I think about it that way. They're in tension with each other. If I focused exclusively on my marriage to the ex what you could do, but it came at the expense of like your kids, that wouldn't be great. And then if I only was focused on family and then like, what I feel like my contributions through my writing and my work would go away, you know, that I would feel like I was leaving something on the table. But also if you told me, Hey, you could sell a hundred percent more books, but, uh, once your kids move out, they'll never come home for the holidays again. Uh -huh. You'll look back, you, you know, you're talking to your wife exclusively through lawyers or something. I wouldn't be like, I won, I did it. Uh -huh. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, and so I think, I think they're in tension with each other, but they also complement and improve each other if done right. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, I guess that's, that's part of it, right? That's to figuring out what, what is that. You have to give up stuff in order to do that. Yes. Like you can't. You well, the, the rule I heard, yeah. I had Austin Kleon here, who I really like. He says, um, work, family, scene, pick two. Yeah. Um, yeah. So we're, I think you can do great work. You can have... You can be a, a good family person, but you're probably not going to get to go to as many parties yeah. or do as much cool. Can't go on the stuff. trips, can't yes. go on the, like, and that's the stuff you have to give up. A lot of people, when you're young, that's tough. Yeah, I always see that with athletes. I'm like, what are you doing at this nightclub? Like, why? Like, what are you there for? I know uh, why I was there. I was yeah, that guy. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Of course. But that's coming at the expense of this other thing, which deep down ultimately brings more happiness and yeah. fulfillment. It, it's probably the reason that I, I didn't get married until I was 30. Yeah. Uh, and I got in the league when I was, shoot, I was just turning 21. So I had a long time to be in the league. Yeah. And, I, and it was it was football and fun for me. Yeah. And that was it. Nothing sure. else mattered. Yeah. Um, and then, but once you get married, I stopped going out, stopped having that quote unquote fun. It's a different type of fun. Yes. Uh, and that's how I was able to remain. You, you can't, you can't have all three. Yes. I think it's either family and work or, yeah. and that's it. And I think that's everything a, else gets the adult work, thing in. that you don't get everything you want. You can't have it all. Yeah. And you have to make trade-offs. Mm. It's tough. That's life though. It's life. Yeah. yeah. I know. Yeah. I know. And I, that, that's, that's part of, you have to plan for it. That, that's part of your root. Me, I have a, I have a routine. Like when yeah. I wake up, I have a, I want to do my writing. I want to do my reading. I want to do all this stuff. And this is. Well, I remember I asked you for, if you wanted, we were having someone over for dinner and if you wanted to come, you're like, no, for, this is like kids movie night. And I was like, oh, I love that. Yeah. Yeah. You're like, this is, this is the thing. I like, I like, I like that where I'll talk to someone they're like, no, I'm home for bath time every night. And like, I, and I think you need that though. In the same way that as an athlete, you need to like, look, practice starts at this time. And if you're like, you know, the, you, you have to have structure, you have to have structure and systems and routine or your life is chaos and disorder. Yeah. And I think family, if done right, although it is disruptive and it blows up your life in a lot of ways, it also provides structure because you really quickly realize kids need structure. You know, like yeah. if, if you're just like, oh, sometimes we're here, sometimes we're there, sometimes we get up at this time, sometimes we go to the, your kids are a nightmare because they're like, the world is chaotic and unpredictable. But when you're like, no, this is when we do these things. Yeah everyone just like there's a stillness to it everyone calms down you just get you realize human beings need like a rhythm yeah yeah i love it that's 
That's what I try to do around the <laughs> the old Gonzalez house. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, this is amazing. Thanks so much. Yeah, yeah my, my pleasure. <laughs>